Hey, thank you guys so much for coming out. I know it's a night for, for people to be out and about, and, and um, so, but I appreciate you guys being here. You know, every single one of us are under construction, and nobody's arrived. Uh, spiritually speaking, speaking, that all started with a thing called faith. And, you know, if you think about it, you believed in somebody that you couldn't see. His name was Jesus. You also believed in a lot of his, in, in, in every single claim that he made. And when Jesus made a claim, it was a pretty audacious claim. You know, for him to be able to say, hey, I'm God in the flesh. You know, for him to be able to say, I'm going to die on a cross. I'm going to rise from the dead. You know, and all these things happen, you know, just the way he says. And uh, for you not to be able to see him and still believe in him requires faith. And once you got that relationship started, you decided to go public with it. So you decided to get baptized. And, you know, the reason you did that was because why in the world would you be ashamed of anybody you love? You know, if you love Jesus, why would you be ashamed of him? And so you go public with your relationship with him by, by getting baptized. And then you make this commitment to communicate with him on a regular basis. And every single time you pray, you talk to him. And every single time you read his word, he talks to you. And this relationship goes deeper and deeper, and you're under construction, and all this stuff is happening. And it doesn't take long for all those people who were high-fiving you after your baptism to kind of go back to their lives and do their thing and go their own way. It happens. It's just the way it is a lot of times. And you recognize that you need a whole lot more strength than you have in and of yourself to walk this walk. So not only does Jesus say that he's going to give you strength, but he also says he has resources for you. And the resources that he has for you is called armor. And, you know, if you think about it, that right there, just that word alone ought to kind of give us all a little bit of a, a, little bit of a scare. I mean, if you, what if you walked into your job, first day on the job, and they laid like a shield and a sword and a helmet down for you? You'd probably be going, what exactly am I going to be doing again? Because I didn't hear about any of this stuff. I mean, just that alone, the fact that he calls it armor, suggests that things could get pretty nasty. And it also suggests that you are in a battle. And I am in a battle. And more than just praying on the armor, and I'm not dissing anybody, and I think you ought to pray on the armor. I'm not dissing anybody. Uh, or speaking on the armor, you know, a lot of people will say. I, I think it boils down to you and I making a whole lot of conscious decisions to, yeah, pray on the armor, but at the same time say, I'm going to live a life of truth. I'm going to have my life completely surrounded by truth because I know i got to have it. I'm going to make right choices, make right decisions. I'm going to hold on to the good news no matter how bad the bad news gets because the good news never changes, right? The gospel never changes. And I can keep my feet, you know, firm even in the face of a pretty scary enemy. Um, I'm also going to believe that God has my best interest at heart, just like Job. Literally after he lost everything, the Bible says he didn't sin with his lips. In other words, he didn't blame God for it, you know, which was amazing. And you know, I honestly believe that even though Job lost everything, he stepped behind the God of the universe and he said, you know what, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will return, you know, uh, praise God basically is how he ended that. And so he was standing behind his shield. And we have to do the same exact thing. We also have to sit back and say, that salvation that was given me is eternal. I'm secure. I'm family. That helps me in everyday life to know that I'm a child of the king, no matter what, you know, that he has washed me in his blood. And to know that I have a weapon that is sharp and very effective and to get to the place in my life where I recognize that, you know what, light always wins over darkness. And truth always wins over lies. And I've got a weapon, and it's very effective. And thank God for all of these things. So then we get to the place where we say, well, now that I've got all that, I need some friends for the journey. And the cool thing about that is to even have some friends that are on the same journey with you so that they can say, hey, are you choosing truth? You got your breastplate on? You know, or whatever. Um, and, and somebody that comes alongside you that's in the same process in the same construction, you know, phase in their life so that they can hold you accountable and so that they can, you know, love you and be there for you and all, and all that. So we, we understand that life is better with friends and life wasn't meant to be lived alone. And then once we go through all of that, you know, we start to ask questions about our life. And I, I, I have people come to me all the time. You know, people will say, so, you know, I got all this stuff and I've been through these things, and I'm trusting God, but sometimes I just don't know what my job in life is. 
I don't know. I mean, if you were to tell me as my pastor and come up to me and point your finger in my face and say, do the will of God, I'd say, okay, I'm sold. I'll do the will of God. What is it? What is it? What does he want me to do? What exactly is it that he wants? Let me tell you one thing, or actually three things that are so true about everybody in this room that is under construction. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 10, this is what God's word says. We are God's masterpieces. That's what you are. You may believe something to the contrary. It's a lie. Remember, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to wrap our lives in truth. That's armor for us. So don't back off the fact that you are a masterpiece of God. And then it says that you're being created anew in Christ Jesus. And the way I like to look at that is I look at everything with a real rudimentary type way because I have to in order to understand it myself. But the truth of the matter is, you know, I, I believe that when I read a verse like that, to me, that's God's way of saying, Barry, I've given you a new reason to get out of bed in the morning. That's what it means to me. I've given you a new reason to get out of bed in the morning. I've given you a new purpose in which to live your life. I've given you, you know, I'm creating you anew in Christ Jesus. You have a new purpose. You have a new job. You have a new outlook on life. You're opening up your eyes to things you've never seen before. This is all new to you. It's a new, you're becoming a new creation in Christ. And then he says, why, why am I doing all this? So you can do all the good works I planned for you to do even before you were born. So basically, that's God's way of saying, you're a masterpiece. I'm creating you a new in Christ Jesus, giving you something to get out of bed in the morning for so that you can accomplish the job that I have for you, the will that I have for you. He has a job for you. He does. He's got a job for you. There are specifically good works that he has intended for you to do, I believe, even before you were born. And real significance is found when you accomplish God's will for your life. I honestly believe that. You say, okay, so I'm down with that. How do I do that? Here's what I believe with all my heart. You understand what you were created for when you begin. First step, you understand what you were created for when you begin to imitate your creator. I honestly believe that. And he, it's like God in his loving grace just kind of walks us through this process and Ephesians is one of those books. That's why if you go to the video after a person accepts Jesus Christ as their Savior, on the video, the very first book, book of the Bible I tell them to read, which is maybe a little atypical, I tell them to read Ephesians. I say go into Ephesians because it is a literal step-by-step -step plan all the way through chapter 6, all the way through relationships in 5, all the way through going rich in, in, in chapter 3, roots down deep in his love, all the way through chapter 6, armor of God, it's like amazing. It's an amazing book of the Bible. And they're all amazing, okay? Don't get me wrong there. But the truth of the matter is I love this because this is what Ephesians 5, 1 and 2 says. Follow God's example in everything you do. That's what I need to hear. I need somebody to look at me and say, hey, Barry, follow God's example in everything you do, okay? It's not rocket science. Just follow his example in everything that you do. Why? Because you're his kid, you're in his family. And then follow the example of Christ. Follow Christ's example. And the only way to do that is to live a life that's full of love. You know why? Because he loved you. He loved you enough to sacrifice his life on a cross, to forgive you of your sins, all of these different things. That's what Ephesians 5, 1 and 2 says. And it tells me, if I want, to me it says, you know, if I want to know what I was created for, then I've got to imitate my creator. As a believer's job, your ministry is to imitate Jesus, to become more and more like Jesus Christ. So if we're going to imitate Jesus, it probably would, probably would make sense that we figure out why he came to this earth in the first place. And Jesus does not pull any punches or... He makes it clear. Jesus literally said, this is why I came. There's three different places in the Bible, and there's more than that, but I'm going to focus on three of them. Three different places in the Bible where Jesus said, I came because this. And we're, if we're supposed to imitate him, then he's basically given us a step-by-step -step plan on what we ought to do and how we ought to imitate him. First reason he came was because he came to seek and save the lost. That's what he said. I'm going to tell you this. I think everybody ought to be seeking and saving lost people. I think everybody... Has, you know, it's, I think it's easy for us to say, well, he's an evangelist and she's an evangelist and, and whatever. I think really we, we all got to be seeking and saving the lost because that's what Jesus did and we're supposed to imitate him. 
He said, the reason I came to this planet was to seek and save the lost. And you say, okay, that's fine, but to be honest with you, I wouldn't know who to talk to, and once I found them, I wouldn't know what to say. And to be honest with you, I'm down with that because I've been doing this 25 years, and I say that at nauseum, and I apologize for that. Um, but sometimes I freak out, and I don't know who to talk to, and I don't know what to say. Same thing. So we all go through that, I believe, in life. So this is something that I came up with. It's just a little thing. I think it's in the PowerPoint. If we go to the next slide, let's see. Well, that's a verse. So go to the, yeah, right there. This is kind of something I came up with when it comes to who do I tell about Jesus? Those who ask, those who cry, or when the Spirit says to try. It's a little rhyme. It's a little poem. It's kind of cool. You all want to say it together? Saturday nights, chill. All right, let's try it. Ready? Here we go. Those who ask, those who cry, or when the Spirit says to try. I'm going to tell you this. People are probably not going to come up to you and say, Barry, what must I do to go to heaven? They're probably not going to say that. Probably not. But they probably, they may come up to you and say, how come you're so stinking happy all the time? They may ask that. Or they may say, how come you're so stable even though you've gone through so much heartache and pain in your life? That is a question Somebody is asking of the reason of the hope that lies within you, just like the verse says, right? And so if they ask, you give them an answer. Just, you just answer them, you know? Um, or if somebody cries. Normally, if somebody's crying, it's because they have, this is what they're saying to you. Hi, how are you? I have a soft heart right now. And you can say whatever you want to me, and it will probably impact me in a, in a very awesome way. They're not saying that, but they're really kind of saying it when tears come down their face. And so you can kind of get close to someone and probably share Jesus with them or pray with them if there are tears. The third thing is basically sometimes the Spirit of God is just going to nudge you, right? The Spirit of God is going to say, hey, go, say something to that person. I don't know how many times I have felt that nudge from the Holy Spirit of God, and I have completely faked. And I, have, I, I watched that person walk away, and I thought, way to go, Barry. You felt the Spirit of God leading you to say something to this person. You didn't say anything. And now I feel like a dork, you know, or a, a scaredy cat <laughs> or whatever, like I was afraid. And, you know, I'm just saying, sometimes the Spirit of God is going to lead you to say something to someone. Now, you're like, well, okay, I'm fine with who I say something to, Now, what do I say? There's three different things you can say. The first thing you can do is just give them a verse. Probably one of the most, if somebody, you you could probably walk up to them and say, look, you've probably seen this verse at at a golf tournament or at a football game or it's been on a bridge that you've gone or underpass, you know, John 3, 16. And you can literally just say to them, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. And then you can kind of explain that a little bit. That's a verse. Or you can do this thing called the Romans Road. The Romans Road really is just four simple verses, and they're all in Romans. So you got the book down, right? You don't have to look at, yes, four different books of the Bible. Very difficult. No. Same book, Romans. It's called Romans Road. Four verses. Here they are. First one is 323. Second one, all you have to do is double the chapter, and it's the same verse, 623. Next one, take a little step back, one step back to chapter 5, 5, 8, and then take five steps forward. Sounds like a sorry, like the board game, sorry. (laughs) And then go five steps forward to chapter 10 and verse number 13. So just remember these verses, 323, 623, 5, 8, 10, 13. You want to try to say it together? Is it up there? Okay, good. Here we go. First one. 323, 623, 5, 8, 10, 13. The cool thing about those verses, number one, 323 says everybody's a sinner. 623 says sin brings death. 5, 8 says Jesus died for you. And 10, 13 says if you call on his name, he'll save you. Those four little simple verses you can share with somebody if they ask, right? Or 
you can just, number two, you can tell them about what Jesus did to you. Now, if you sit back and think about that for a little while, it's easy for a pastor to get up and say, just share what Jesus has done in your life. And everybody's like, yeah, cool. But you still don't know what to say, right? If you think about it, if you really think about it, what has Jesus done in my life? Well, here's what you could say. You could say something like this. Well, so I have faith in this guy I can't see. His name is Jesus. I believe that he actually did die on a cross, that he rose again the third day, and I believe his claims, that he's God in the flesh and all these other things. But let me tell you the best part of this story. And you're halfway through the story already. The best part of the story is as soon as I believed those things, my life changed. My marriage got better. I had joy, even though I'm struggling in a lot of areas. I stopped yelling at people on 66. It's the craziest thing in the world. And it's linked to the resurrection. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I'm just saying, if you start talking to people that way, in a very practical way, about really what Jesus has done for you in your life, they're going to be like, well, what do I got to do? Because I'm tired of yelling at people on 66. I'm just making it real, you know, for where people are in their life. And the last thing you can do is very, very simple. All you have to do is this. Would you please go with me to Park Valley Church? Would you please go with me to church? You say, well, that doesn't sound as powerful. Can I show, how, can I show you how powerful this? is? I'm going to show you a picture of this woman right here. That woman is an absolutely amazing woman. Her name is Mrs. Melander. So Mrs. Melander's walking down the sidewalk one day. And she walks it, she sees this lady. The lady's name is Mary White. She says to Mary, I want you and your husband to come with me to Jerusalem Baptist Church. It's over by George Mason University at 123 in Braddock Road. My, I, was, I gave it away, my grandmother. It was my grandmother. My grandmother goes home, and she says, Floyd. Floyd says, hmm, yeah. <laughs> Mrs. Mellinder invited us to church, and then she said this, and I think we ought to go. And granddad said, I'll go, but I'm not going to Sunday school. <laughs> and she said, okay. So they went that Sunday to church. Then they went the next Sunday to church. Then they went the next Sunday to church. And at the end of the service, my grandmother's looking all around for my grandfather. And she notices him at the front on his knees. in Christ. Crazy thing about it was he ends up leading his kids to Christ. One of them, my dad, Roger. He then ends up going and starting a church called Bethlehem Baptist Church that, to be honest with you, I honestly believe that thousands of people have given their lives to Jesus Christ as a result of the ministry of Bethlehem Baptist Church. They supported missionaries all over the world who were telling people all over the world, thousands of people all over the world, about Jesus Christ. And then his, two of his grandsons now are working in a church in Haymarket that are winning people to Jesus Christ. And I'm going to tell you something. You go back to one lady who had the guts to walk up to my grandmother on a sidewalk and simply ask very one simple question. Would you go with me to church? this Sunday. It's a big deal. It's a big deal what God can do if we ask a very, very simple question. The second reason Jesus came to this earth is because he came to give people abundant life. John 10.10, 10, Satan, he's a thief. He comes to steal and destroy. That's all he's got. I, on the other hand, Jesus, I've come to give people life. And that they may have life abundantly. So, I look at this and I know that I can't give people life. I can tell people about eternal life. But I can also ask myself the question, what am I doing? If I look at that Greek word, I understand that that Greek word 
refers to a super abundant quality of life. And I ask myself the question, of the people who come into contact with me, are they having a better quality of life because they met Barry White? Am I adding to the quality of life of the people that come into my life? And if I am, then who am I imitating? Jesus. Because Jesus gave people abundant life. Jesus gave people life. And it's the same exact thing with us, you know. Matthew chapter 25, 35 and 36 kind of give us some ways to do it. Hey, I was hungry. You gave me some food. I was thirsty. You gave me a drink. I was a stranger. You invited me in. I needed clothes. You gave me some clothes. I was sick. You look after me. I was in prison. You came and you visited me. You want to be like Jesus? Then contribute to the quality of life of the people that come into contact with you. Number three, he came to be a servant. And that's what I wanted to focus on for just a few minutes. He came to be a servant. Matthew chapter 20, verse number 28 says this. Just as the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve. He basically says this. I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. And we have said it so many different times in our church that it is impossible for any of us to be like Jesus if we're not willing to be a servant. Because that's what he is. That's what he was. That's what he came to do. He came for the purpose of being a servant. We've said so many times that, I think a lot of times, it boils down to the fact that all of us were, were created to make a contribution with our life. And when you make a contribution with your life, you just feel better about yourself. Why is that? I mean, you feel better about yourself when you make some kind of a contribution. And we've always looked at that little illustration about the Sea of Galilee, how it constantly consumes water and consumes water, but yet it also contributes water. Water enters the Sea of Galilee and also leaves the Sea of Galilee, and henceforth it is filled with life. But there's another body of water to the south of the Sea of Galilee that all it does is consume, consume, and consume with no outlet whatsoever. And there's a reason they call it the Dead Sea. Because when you make a contribution with your life, the bottom line is it just seems to add life. It just seems to give us the opportunity to truly understand what life's all about. I'm going up 15, up the hill, to all that traffic. That's the one big area we have traffic here in the metropolis of Haymarket as you're trying to head from the church up towards Sheets or whatever. I noticed there's a car with their flashers on. They're right in the lane. I'm like, what? And everybody's ticked, and I was a little bit ticked. And I got up to this guy, and I looked, and there was a kid driving the car, and his car broke down. And he looked so flustered. So I get out of the car, and I said, pop the emergency brake, and I don't even know what I'm saying. We're on a hill like this. I'm getting behind the car to push the car, and I'm saying, pop the emergency brake. Sometimes we think we're superheroes, but we're not. <laughs> so everybody's, there's this truck full of men. They're all going, ha, ah. they're laughing at me. They think I'm going to get run over by a car. And so they pop it. He pops it, and he gets in, you know, and all of a sudden some other guy in a truck gets out of his truck, runs behind, and we both start pushing it, and we get the thing off to the side. And I said to the kid, I said, do you need any help? He goes, no, my mom's coming. I said, all right, good. So I got back in the car, and I left. And as I was driving away, I felt great. I think I jammed. I turned on the radio loud. I was like, I don't know. That happened another time, too, when that dude fell over on the Harley-Davidson. And I, but, you know, truth of the matter is, you, you try to help someone and serve someone, you just feel great. And the reason you feel great was because that's how God wired you. He wired you to serve. He wired you to make a contribution. Every single one of us have been wired that way. And so let me just say three quick things because we got plenty of time, three quick things about why does service make us feel so significant and lead to such significance. Number one, because servants get to see the miracle. Servants get to see the miracle. So last weekend, I was talking to Chris Monday. Chris Monday is on our worship team, and he came up and he taught me this principle last weekend. And so I'm stealing it from him, wherever he is. I just want him to know that. So 
The first miracle that Jesus did was he turned water into wine, right? This was at a wedding feast at Cana. Mary is there. She's stressing. (laughs) There's no more wine. So she goes to Jesus and says, we have a crisis. Jesus basically, I'm sure in a very acceptable way, said, why is that my problem? I don't know if he actually said that, but it seems that way. Then Mary looks at all of the servants, all of the people there that are working, all of the people there that are contributing, not the party goers, but all the servants. She looks at the servants and she says, do whatever he says. And they go, okay. So Jesus sees six stone pots, right? These are ceremonially, these are pots that they use for ceremonial cleansing before they eat and There is not a Jewish person alive that would drink anything out of those pots. But Jesus is mixing it up and changing things around. So he says, fill those pots with water. And that's what happens. We pick it up in John chapter 2 and verse 7. Fill the jars with water. When the jars were filled to the brim, he said this. Dip some out. Take it to the master of ceremonies or the guy that's running the show. And so they, you know, followed his instructions. That took a lot of faith right there because they knew water went in. So they're dipping what they think is water out, putting it in a cup and taking it to the guy that's in charge. And they're probably sweating the whole way. That's a step of faith for them to do this. So they give it to him, but it has been turned into wine, the Bible says. But this is interesting to me. Verse number nine says, not knowing where it had come from. The guy who's leading the party gets to drink the wine and he gets to enjoy that and whatever. But he didn't know what had happened behind the scenes. In parentheses, the Bible says, though, of course, the servants knew. In other words, the cool thing about it was the servants got to see the water changed into wine because they were serving, because they were working. The long and short of it is the servant gets to see the miracle. The servant is close to the work and close to the Lord and in you know, you know, behind the scenes and seeing everything that's going on. They get to see the miracle. The cool thing about it is that the verse ends with the disciples then began to have faith in him because they saw a glimpse of the glory of Jesus for the very first time and all those servants got an opportunity to do the same exact thing, which I think was pretty awesome. The servant gets to see the miracle. And so, you know, I get to thinking about people here. Anybody can see our children's ministry and say, wow, what a wonderful children's ministry. But it's the people that roll their sleeves up and are setting it up and in the back dealing with the kids and teaching the kids. They get to see the miracle because they see the kids' lives change. They see the kids that accept Christ. They see the kids that get baptized. They they see the kids that start having an interest and a hunger for God's word because they're so close to it, they see the miracle happen, which is cool. And yes, it takes commitment. It does. It takes commitment. But can I ask you this? I mean, I guess I'm not asking. I guess I would just say, I have no problem asking somebody to be committed to the greatest work in all the world, which is the work of the church, which is God's work. Not to mention the fact that it's your commitments that define you anyway. Whatever you're committed to is really what you end up becoming. And so to be committed to his work is an awesome thing. To put yourself in a position to see the God of the universe do the miraculous is going to do nothing but grow your faith. That's all it's going to do. Just like at the end of this verse in John, their faith grew because they saw his glory and they saw the miracle take place. It's absolutely amazing. People that do the setup, you know what's amazing to me? There are people that come at 6.30 in the morning and set up the, the, the high school. And I mean, they're just blowing it out. These people get to see the miracle. The miracle is, and this is a fact, thank God, to God be the glory. We've been over at Battlefield High School for one year. Our church has grown by 26% in the last year just because we've been at Battlefield High School. God is growing our church over there. (laughs) Praise God for that. And the people that are over there sweating to the oldies or whatever. Sounds like Richard Simmons, but... I mean, they're seeing the miracle. You know, they're seeing the miracle. Um, 
I want you to see a, a story real fast of a guy named Eric. Hello, my name is Eric Folks. Um, I've been going to Park Valley Church uh, roughly four to five years now with my family, of course. Um, really heard about uh, Park Valley Church uh, through the Trunk or Treat events. Uh, my wife um, and my son, uh, before our daughter was born, uh, she would, uh, my wife would take our son. Um, they came here for about two years, uh, really before we started uh, be, you know, becoming Park Valley um, Church regulars, I guess I could say that. Throughout the years, we have uh, come to Park Valley um, and just really week after week, I, I really felt like I was being called to do something, to get involved, to get engaged. I would sit in the seats and I would hear of the opportunities uh, to, 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 to be able to serve. Um, and with that, uh, I started to, to nudge on my wife a little bit, you know, hey, I'm a little hesitant. I just want to talk to you about this. I'm a little hesitant to, to get involved. What if I commit and I can't make it on a Sunday or, or you know, just, just a lot of the things that we naturally get nervous about, the what ifs. Um, so I, I decided uh, after one service, uh, one Sunday, um, I remember one of the pastors just said, if you want to serve, just show up. And, and I really felt like that was my time. And, and I, I showed up on a Sunday morning, you know, at 6.30 and it started to serve. Um, really no real agenda, just show up and, and, and figure out what to do. Um, and now I've been serving for about three to four months. It's, it's been a while. Um, and it's just been a great experience. Um, every Sunday we show up, we have a great time, there's music and, and we just, it's almost like a, like a set up party. I've always had a, a heart to help people, uh, but I'm a little reserved, I'm a little quiet. Uh, most people don't expect that, that Sunday Eric that they see, they don't expect that. Um, I even notice sometimes by the way they react and that's okay. Um, but it's becoming my norm. So, so the church is really helping, the, the servant is really helping me become a different person um, for God's kingdom and not just the, Eric, I'm in my zone. You know, and, and, and I mean that, that's, that's truth, man. Uh, me and my wife was talking about that the other day. Um, Trey's basketball coach has been coaching him for years. I've known this guy, Coach Smith, for years. I ran into him in church the other, other week for the first time. Um, and it was his first time there. And I was like, man, you know, you're gonna love it here. And he's like, yeah, we're looking for a home and this, that, and the other. I'm like, you're gonna love it here. I know the high school setting's a little different, but I'm, but I'm telling you, man, I am becoming a better person. I've been, I'm a better father, I'm a, I'm a better server, I'm a better uh, husband, you know, just the whole nine. And I encourage you to, to come here for a few weeks, you know, and check it out. And so I seen him, this was about three or four Sundays ago, and I seen him this past Sunday, and he was like, man, that, that day that I came in here, I needed to hear that message. He was like, I would have never guessed you to tell me those words. I've known you for, for years. And I go, I know, I'm a little reserved. I come to practice, I just kind of stand off in my corner. Um, but but it is, God is opening my heart, man. And it's, it's a lot of it's due to this church. I mean, it really is. I would encourage any person that wants to get plugged in, that wants to help, that wants to serve, it, it, I, I would just encourage you to just try it. Um, you know, a lot of people may think or feel like it's a responsibility you have to, you know, you have to do every Sunday. But for me, I just wake up, I show up, and the day just takes care of itself. The energy's there, the joy is there. It, it is such a blessing to be able to give back um, to the community that gave so much to help me and my family to be on the path that we're currently on. Second thing fast is uh, service makes greatness achievable. I think a lot of times what we do is, is we associate greatness with power, money, fame. You know, if that's what greatness is, then most of us don't have a shot, you know. Um, God says that's not what makes or determines greatness at all. As a matter of fact, if you want to be great, he said, be a servant, Matthew 23, 11, and 12. And so I honestly think anytime you serve someone, by the way, you know, when, when the word Greatness, if you look at it in the Greek, it, it literally refers to being number one. That's what it means. You're number one. I'm number one, uh, which is cool. So anytime you serve someone, you're number one. I think you ought to get a foam finger for that. Just happen to have a few of them right here, some foam fingers. Um, so serve a person, you're number one. Be second in line, let somebody else go forward, you're number one. So, we got any servants over here in the house? Got a servant right there? I'm going to try to get it to him, all right? Here we go. 
Oh, that wasn't too bad. Any servants over here? Foam finger. Got a foam finger? I'm going to just throw it like that. Thank you. Sorry about the coffee spill. Foam finger over here. We got a number one servant. Oh, I faked on you there. Literally, foam finger it. You know, I mean, might as well because the Bible says that, you know, you're number one. Greatness. Now, the world looks at a certain amount of things as, as great. Truth of the matter is, let me give you an example, and I'm wrapping up. One, one weekend, I, I didn't preach, and so I just kind of got to sit and observe. So I'm sitting, I'm listening to the, uh, I don't remember who it was that was preaching, and then I, I really had a hard time paying attention to him. One of the reasons I did was because there was a family sitting to my left. They had a child who was now an adult, uh, but this child, their child, was severely handicapped, you know, in a uh, wheelchair. And what got my attention was a mom who was just loving on that child and rubbing that child's back and wiping the child's mouth and just whispering in that child's ear. And I sat back and I thought, that's greatness. That's literally greatness. I think about, you know, my dad right now is going over to his parents' house. My grandparents that I just referred to, that Mrs. Mellinder asked to go to church. Both of them are, they're both terminally ill. And um, they can't hardly do anything for themselves anymore. So my dad and, my, and his brothers basically have to stay there all day and all night and take care of them. And nobody sees that. Nobody knows about that. But that's greatness. You know, when I, I, think, about, I think about the verse in Romans, chapter 14, verses 11 and 12, it says, for it's written, as I live, says, says the Lord, every knee's going to bow to me. Every tongue will confess to God. So then every one of us will give an account of himself to God. Greatness matters in the eyes of the one who made us. That's what matters. Because you're not going to give an account to anyone else for your life. You're going to give an account to God. And so let's, be, let's have our eyes open to the things that truly are greatness. True greatness is, is service. The last thing is, and it's very short, is servants, servants are used by God. And I've been just pounding through numbers and reading through the book of numbers. And I see the way Moses interacts with the people. And I see the fact that Moses is literally, I love what God says. Oh, Moses, oh, all the, all the other prophets, yeah, visions, dreams, whatever. Moses, face to face. That's what God says in numbers about Moses. I talk to him face to face. He's my guy, all right? And it's interesting that he said that. God protected him from his enemies. God even protected him from his own family that stood up and criticized him. You know what happened there with Miriam and Aaron and all that stuff. Um, but the cool thing about it is, I don't think it's a coincidence, same chapter, all this happens, Numbers chapter 12 and verse 3, this is what God says about Moses. Moses was more humble than any other person on earth. Humility, service. God uses the servant. God uses the people who are going to be humble. And so what I say is this. If, if the next step in your construction is for you to find out, you know, basically that you were created, you know, by God for a reason and that you have a job and that you have something that God has ordained for you to do long before you were born. He already knew about all of it. And so we start by finding out what, we're, what we were created for by imitating our creator. And then we ask ourselves questions like, who do we need to point to Christ? And whose life do we need to improve the quality of just because we touch their life? And, you know, who is it that we need to truly roll our sleeves up and serve? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes for just a minute? If you're here tonight and you have never put your faith and trust in Jesus, to be able to just say the words, you know, I believe that Jesus is who he said he was. I believe that he died on the cross. I believe that three days later he rose from the dead. I believe it. And, you know, if you've never made that declaration, if you have never, you know, truly had that faith or started that relationship with, by believing in Jesus and having faith in Jesus, then, 
You can do that right now. I'm telling you the truth. Jesus is real. He's God in the flesh. He died on the cross. He rose from the dead three days later. He shed his blood to wash away your sins. That's the truth. Question, do you or do you not believe it? If you believe it, will you tell him? If you believe it, will you give him your heart? You can do it right now. Why don't you just say a simple prayer? You don't even have to say it out loud. Why don't you just pray something like this? Dear Heavenly Father, I'm sorry for my sin. I admit it. I'm a sinner. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I believe you rose from the dead. I've never seen you, but I believe in you. I have faith in you. And I give you my life right now. I want you to know that I love you and I'm giving you my life. I pray that you would change my life. I pray that you would give me a home in heaven. I pray that you would wash away my sin. I pray that you would make me a part of your family. I pray that I would never be the same again after praying this prayer. I give you my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I want to ask you just to stand if you would.